Should churches be careful to use words like resurrection, Calvary, or the blood in their marketing, or is marketing taking it too far in diluting the gospel? We're talking about it all right here on the podcast. Let's go. What is up, faithful friends of YouTube? So excited to be back on the podcast today. We're talking all things evangelism and marketing and how if marketing has kind of taken over in the church as the primary evangelistic strategy for many of our churches all over the U.S. and quite frankly, all over the world. Um, my name is Jose Lopez. If you're here for the first time, I'm glad that you could join us. Do me a favor. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Tap on that notification bell to let you know every time we post some new content right here on the channel. It really helps us out. And also leave a, a comment, like, share. It helps us to kind of fight against the algorithm of YouTube and get our content out there to reach far and wide. The whole point of this podcast is to teach and encourage people to live biblically and live out a faith that disrupts their life and their culture. And so uh, if you find any of these resources useful, let us know and also share it. It's awesome. So unless you've been living under the rock, uh, you probably have come across uh, this heat that Elevation Church has been getting lately uh, due to one of their staff members being on an interview that made some comments about how they do not mention words like resurrection, uh, Calvary, the blood, because they don't want anyone to feel like outsiders. So I want to look at these clips. I want to share some of these clips with you and look at them in their context uh, so that we don't misinterpret anything and get, we want to give them the benefit of the doubt. But I want to share this first clip with you and then we'll kind of get into the whole premise of what we're going to talk about um, and talk about whether or not churches to be focused on filtering the marketing as a strategy of evangelism or is it going too far right or not going far enough for some of us believers so check this out this is a woman by the name of nick Shear. she's a staff member of elevation church who's responsible for all the copyright stuff uh, that comes out of elevation church she kind of monitors everything that goes out into the public and uh kind of uh, filters everything uh, to ensure that the voice, as she would say, of elevation is being properly distributed throughout social media and the internet. So check out this first clip um, where she explains why they do not use words like resurrection, Calvary, and the blood. Check this out. Uh, it's also Easter season. You know, you mentioned just coming out of an Easter meeting. Uh, Easter's a bit earlier this year, uh, but by the time this goes out, it is still pre-Easter. I'd love to hear about like, what are you specifically tackling for Easter right now? Like, okay, this is gonna be a bigger service for most churches. What are some of the things that you have to get your, you know, ducks in a row as it were in respect to Easter? Um, For us, the most important thing on Easter is inviting people to church. Um, it is, uh, it's the Sunday for us that we have one of the highest attendance. People tend to come to Easter more than Christmas. Um, and so it's the, it's, it, and I think a lot of that is uh, location specific. Uh, so for instance, uh, how people are gonna come in the Southern United States as opposed to Canada, uh, that will probably be different, right? And so so you have to apply this to your to your own scenario. but. Um, but for us, we know that we tend to see people um, more easily come to church on Easter. And so knowing that, uh, we try to capitalize on the opportunity. Um, the mission of Elevation Church, we exist so that people far from God will be raised to life in Christ. That's our mission. And, and so when I think about Easter and I think about the mission of reaching people far from God um, and, and, and what Jesus, like, uh, Easter and Christmas are the only two Sundays of the year that are actually wrapped around a particular passage in the Bible, right? A lot of, most of our other Sundays are, 
whatever the pastor wants to preach on, you know, any particular thing or whatever. But but Easter and Christmas are both around particular biblical events. And so this particular biblical event of Easter is tied directly to our mission. Um, and so, so that's so important to us. And so when I think about how I'm going to talk about Easter, I'm thinking about talking to people far from God. Um, so because that's the thing that matters most to us. And so uh, so just to like give you just like a teeny bit of a glimpse I'm talking all the way from people who have been in our church for years, and I want them to invite people to church, all the way to people who've never heard of our church before and trying to get them to come to church, right? People who are unchurched, you might say. And so how do I talk to those two people are really different. Um, but I'm putting a lot of my focus, energy, time, resources toward what I would call the cold audience as people far from God. And so I'm not going to say the word Calvary. I'm not going to say the word resurrection. I'm not going to say the blood of Jesus, uh, right? Um, I'm not going to say any of these words that make someone feel like an outsider. So that right there is interesting. So what she's saying is because they are focused on primarily for Easter Sunday and their services, they're focused primarily on reaching people. They're filtering their content and the words that they use through the lens of reaching people so they will not use words like resurrection calvary or the blood for the sake of not making people feel like outsiders so she's claiming that the church will say this well, i'll show you the next clip the church will say this when People are in their churches. They'll say this during their message. They'll say this during worship, whatever, you know. And however you feel about Elevation Church, unless you're there, I won't speak on um, what they do or do not do. I personally do not watch a lot of Elevation messages. I used to a while back, but I've kind of pulled back um, from doing that. Um, so I don't haven't listened to a lot of recent messages. So I can't really speak on whether or not Stephen Furtick will or will not uh, talk about the resurrection this Easter. But she's saying they will. They just won't do it in their in the context of their advertising and marketing for the sake of not making people feel like they're outsiders. She's saying we just won't say it outside of our church. So here's the problem that I have. With this, right? And I want to start off by saying this is not an elevation thing. This is not strictly an elevation tactic. This is a problem across the church as a whole. The large church model, the mega church model, the evangelical mega church. Uh, this is an evangelical mega church thing, right? This is not elevation church thing. The elevation church is just highlighting the issue because they are one of the most famous churches. They're the well-known church. You know, uh, Stephen Furtick is one of the, if not the most famous pastor um, in the world, right? Like, if you don't know who Stephen Furtick is, you're living under a rock, right? He, he's a celebrity. He's well-known. But the real problem with this is the motivation. Now, the motivation they claim to make for this is that they are reaching people who are far from Jesus, right? Their whole mission, she said, is to reach people far from Jesus that they might be raised to life. Cool mission statement. Similar to 99.999% of evangelical churches all over the U.S. and all over the world. But the problem is, the motivation, their motivation is reaching people far from Jesus, reaching people far from Jesus. And it all has to do with this church's ecclesiology. Now, what I mean by that is their theology on the nature and the structure of the church, what the church is, how it functions, why the church exists. So what they're saying is we, the church, we, Elevation Church, exist to reach people far like Jesus. So we're going to not use words that make them feel like outsiders. We're going to use words that make people want to come in and feel like they're home. And everybody here 
is welcome and everybody and that's that's not a bad thing people should be welcome in the churches people should feel uh should feel like they a, a sense of belonging when they come they shouldn't feel like outsiders and they shouldn't feel um uh, like like they're being rejected and pushed away and uh, they're being judged like that. We can all agree on that, right? Uh, but what is the church? Why does the church biblically exist? How should it function, right? Is, is evangelism the main aspect, purpose, and function of a church? Or are churches like this... Uh, really using this as the main aspect or focus of the church like is it a problem that this is the main goal of our church services is to reach people some would say no some would say that's the church's mission to go and be a witness right to to make disciples matthew chapter 28 Right, We get the Great Commission, chapter 20, verse 18 to 20. It says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. That's what many evangelical churches would use as their reaching aspect of their mission. Right, Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. The discipleship aspect, right? So however you play this out in a lot of evangelical churches, especially if you're part of certain organizations and network, you'll hear it phrased similarly, if not exactly the same. Similarly, if not exactly the same. You'll hear it said like, we exist to reach people far like far from Jesus, to equip Christ followers and go to all the nations. We exist to reach people far from Jesus and make a difference. We exist to reach people far from Jesus, equip believers, and go into the world. Like You can rephrase that however you want. That's basically the mission of the church, is to reach people far from Jesus, to equip people, uh, to disciple the church, and then to go out into the world and make a difference. But the problem that I have with churches like this is that the main aspect becomes the reaching. And then what ends up happening is we negate the discipling aspect of it. And then because we negate the discipling aspect of it, we don't have much to send into the world to teach the gospel and be witnesses, right? Because evangelism has become the main purpose, function, aspect of the church rather than just an aspect of the church of the church so everything they do everything they say every aspect of their church is is constructed and put together and done so that people feel welcome and comfortable in every way and you'll often hear them say from the street to the seat right we want people to feel welcome we want people to feel joy and excitement. And so we stand outside our churches with little greeter signs and we offer coffee and donuts and we dance around and we keep the energy high. And, you know, we use a specific language and we use uh, our, our, our specific church voice. And we don't say churches, we say location. We don't say uh, campus, we say location, right? Like, there's, there's all these different strategies that really stem from businesses rather than the Bible. And I think that's the problem is that we have allowed the business strategies, the business concepts, the, the business tactics in, uh, in, in business growth to infiltrate the church and so what ends up happening is rather than the church going out into the world and making a difference the world has come into the church and is making a difference in the church and and if you don't see if you don't see eye to eye with their ecclesiology and the way that they're doing church and this idea of reaching people far from Jesus if if reaching people far from Jesus is not important to you if you don't agree with us not using certain words and certain language and certain uh, phrases, 
then you don't really have a missional heart and you don't have a heart for reaching people. And that's why small churches are small because they don't understand that by using phrases like resurrection, the blood, and <laughs> and Calvary, they're really diminishing their growth and they're making themselves ineffective and they're not reaching people. And that's why churches like Ferdix Church or other large mega churches exist and are successful because they are effective and focused in, on reaching people far from God. But what but what if you it, it, what if you looked at the Bible about this, right? If you look at the Bible, you don't see evangelism happening in the temple or the church. You don't see evangelism happening through marketing strategies and business strategies. You don't see uh, evangelism happening or uh, it being filtered through a catered environment where everything is carefully and manipulated and structured in a way that makes people feel comfortable enough to be in our environments where it's it's not carefully so thought out and planned out right the, the church didn't gather to reach those far from Jesus they went to where the people were gathered for the sake of reaching those who are far from Jesus they didn't gather people who are far from Jesus they went out into the streets to reach people far from Jesus and that's where we've kind of messed it up. Now, I think it's important that evangelism be an aspect of our churches. I think evangelism and pre preaching the gospel, that's what evangelism really is, is preaching the gospel of Jesus should be the aspect, an aspect of our church services. But it's not, the, the Bible never state, makes a statement or indicates that it is the main aspect of our services. That is the main aspect of the gathering of the ecclesia, which is the gathering of the called out ones. The modern church and their business growth, I mean, their church growth mindsets and strategies have made it that. But the church would, would be way more effective in evangelism if we taught our members to be biblically literate enough and passionate enough to share the gospel no matter what environment they find themselves in. I think the church would be way more effective in evangelism if we taught people the Bible, if we taught people the importance of the words resurrection, of the importance of the atoning blood, the importance of what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary and the sacrifice that he made and the blood that he shed and the punishment that he suffered and the death that he experienced and the resurrection that he uh, was raised to life so that we might also be raised to life in him. If we would equip our believers and our disciples and our church members to actually know what they believe, why they believe it, and then to live out what they believe, I think the church would be way more effective in its evangelism but we don't want people to feel like outsiders. We don't want to say things that are too complicated to understand because it's really difficult to understand what resurrection means. The reality is my 10-year-old son could tell you what it means for something to be resurrected. He could tell you what it was at the age of five. It simply means something came back to life. Now, in the context of the church, it means that Jesus came back to life. That he died in a he died and he laid in a tomb for three days. And on the third day, he resurrected and was raised unto life. And now here's here here's another clip. Here's another clip of this interview as it continued. And I want you to see and to listen to what Brady Shear kind of translates the uh, resurrection to. And and I want to I want to say I'm not hating on Brady Shear. I'm I'm not hating on uh his his website, company, his business and what they do. They give they provide resources for church growth and all that stuff. 
awesome. I, I don't have a problem with that. I'm not hating on him. I'm just pointing out, I want to point out a very uh, serious red flag in the church. Check this, check this clip out. Okay, I got to ask, it really stood out to me when you were describing language for invitation. And I think it's really cl important here to distinguish what Nikki's describing as the starting point for folks and then where you eventually get led to when you actually attend church and how those are very, very different. The starting point is not the end point. But you said one word we're not going to use in talking about Easter to folks that don't know anything about church is the word resurrection. Mm -hmm. I think saying we plead the blood of Christ over you. I think it's understandable why we might not use that language, uh, yeah. but it's so common in church to be like, you know what's next week? Resurrection Sunday. Mm -hmm. We often retitle Easter to put that directly into the name. So can you... So I think we've actually done the opposite. I think it always was intended to be resurrection, and we actually changed the word resurrection and subbed it out for Easter, and now we're having a problem with saying, hey, no, it's not Easter. It's not about bunnies and eggs, although I have no problems with that. My kids go out and we do egg hunts and stuff like that. But they know the main purpose of Easter is not about bunnies and eggs, but it was about the resurrection of Jesus. And so why are we having a problem with this? Why, why is it a problem to kind of reorient our conventional way of thinking to say, whoa, no, we're not renaming Easter to resurrection. We're bringing back the entire culmination, the importance of Easter, which is the resurrection of Jesus. That's that's what we're doing. I think I think I think he's wrong. I think it's the opposite. I think we're so accustomed now to have swapped resurrection with Easter to make it more palatable. And so now we have a problem with it being the other way around. Talk about like the decision for why not to use something uh, like that for someone that might be like, wait a minute, why can't we use that? Mm -hmm. uh, so just to like be clear, we'll use that in church. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll hear Pastor Steven say that. You'll hear our host say that from stage uh, where we're not using that is outside. Um, so uh, and that's because uh, resurrection is not an everyday conversation. If you talk to someone who doesn't know Christ, they are never going to say the word resurrection. That it, there's just not. Okay, I'll give you that. It's not commonly talked about in the context of its biblical definition of the resurrection of Jesus. If you're talking to an unchurched person and they don't know about the resurrection, they're not going to use it in their everyday language. I don't think that means we shouldn't talk about it. I don't think that means we shouldn't share it. I don't think that means we should completely eliminate and eradicate the word. And now I'll give her the benefit of the doubt and I'll give ele elevation the benefit of the doubt that there's what she's saying is, hey, we're going to use this in the context of our church service. Pastor Stephen Furtick will say it. All these things will sing about it, blah, blah. Right. But we're not going to talk about this outside of church because it's not a usual word that people are accustomed to. OK, but the entire gospel is not what people are accustomed to. The entire gospel is not what we share in our everyday talk. What if we actually did talk about the gospel a little more in our society? What if we did talk about the gospel a little more in our relationships? What if we did talk about the gospel more in our workplaces, in our schools? How would things look different? Like, it's just not going to be, it's not a word that's in normal language. And so I, instead of saying, but they do know what Easter is, they do know Easter Sunday. And so, so we don't Christianize it in the, in the language to people who are far from God. Um, I'd rather say um, Jesus was raised to life. I'd rather say that. Jesus came back to life again after dying for us. I'd rather say that. Um, it's clear. You, it's weird. What? How did that happen? But still, like, you get what I'm saying. Yeah, and I love the way that you've talked about, hey, here's how we're going to talk about with folks that are familiar with the language, and here's how. Okay, this is, this is the part where I disagree with what Brady Shear says, and I'll tell you why. We're not going to talk about it. So there's a source scripture, and that source scripture inspires two different expressions of the language. So for instance, you could say to someone that is not going to ever use the word resurrection, like, hey, we're bringing hope out of hopelessness. Well, what is that? That's resurrection. You take something that's dead, and you're bringing it back to life. 
but it's an accessible language that someone that doesn't have any like experience with like, wait, wait, what does resurrection mean? It's the same meaning to them and you can meet them where they're at. And then it sounds like, Hey, once we're in church, that's the whole point. Now we're going to lead them to where we want them to be. Yeah, okay. absolutely. So what do you say? Here's what I disagree with. And this is, this is not a Brady Shear thing. This is not an elevation church. This is the problem with the modern evangelical church and the way that we talk about the gospel where he says, we're bringing hope out of hopelessness, and that is the resurrection. Okay, here's the thing. Jesus did not lay all of his riches, glory, power, majesty, rule and reign, dominion, get up off of his throne, come down to earth to live the life of a man like you and I, die a gruesome, horrific death where he was betrayed, beaten, bloodied, put a, 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 thorn, a, a crown of thorns put on his head, whipped by cat and nine tails, spit on, mocked, ridiculed, crucified, suffocated, bled to death, died and laid in a tomb for three days and resurrected to life to give us hope to give us joy, to give us peace. Those are all following symptoms or benefits of salvation, but the salvation and the purpose of his crucifixion, of the work that he did on Calvary, the blood that he shed to atone for us was for our sins, not our hope. Jesus' sacrifice was to save us from our sins. When the angel came to Mary and he came to the shepherds, he let the, them know, yes, there would be peace on earth to all men, but the peace on earth that we would have is peace within our soul. To Mary, he said, his name shall be Jesus, and he shall save people from their sins, not their sadness, not their sorrow, not their hopelessness. The hopelessness that we have is that we are sinners who cannot save ourselves from ourselves or from any punishment or wrath that we deserve. And so therefore, Jesus had to come, shed his blood on Calvary, die, lay in a tomb, and resurrect from the dead so that we might be resurrected to life in him so that our sins would be paid for, atoned for, that we might receive his righteousness by his finished work through faith in Christ Jesus alone by grace. That's the message of the gospel. But we don't want to share the true wholeness and fullness of the gospel because it will either trigger people or it will transform people. The gospel, and here, here's the thing, I'm not talking about the church being offensive for the sake of, of being offensive. The gospel is offensive enough. The church should not be offensive, but the gospel will offend. That's a very real truth. The gospel will either trigger people or it will transform people. And we see this all throughout scripture where people would either upset, get upset with what Jesus or his disciples said in the book of Acts, or they would be transformed by the power of the gospel and the Holy Spirit's work in their life. And so we see this all throughout scripture. But what it seems like is we're more concerned with not triggering people than we are with the gospel transforming people. We're, we're more concerned about not triggering people than we are concerned about the gospel actually transforming people's lives. I think it's good to remember that Jesus was a very triggering person. You ever stop and think about that? That Jesus didn't make the gospel more palatable? That Jesus didn't make it easy for people to, to want to draw in and come near all the time? Yes, there were, there were, there were times, and, and there's a lot, where he would allow people that should not approach him, approach him according to religious law, and he would show them mercy and grace. And when people would would deserve to be stoned, he, he, you who is without sin, sin, cast the first stone, right? Like, But if we really think about it, 
Jesus also made it very difficult for people to pretend to be his disciples. And he made it very difficult for people who were following him to continue to follow him if they weren't truly believing in him. I mean, you look at this and you look at John chapter 6. After Jesus does this incredible miracles where he feeds 5,000 people with a handful of fish and a handful of bread and, 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 you know, with this kid's lunch, and he feeds 5,000 people, does an incredible miracle. He leaves those people, goes into a different town. Those people follow him into another town, and Jesus is like, I got to do something here, right? I've got this crowd following me, and so... In John chapter 6, verse 51, we see Jesus talking about how he is the bread of life, how he is the bread that comes down from heaven. And if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever, right? Let's look at that. John chapter 6, verse 51 to 58. And it says, I am the living bread. That came from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The the Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So they're thinking, is Jesus calling us to be cannibals? Is that what we're doing now? We're starting a cannibalistic cult? And 53. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, you have no life in you, right? So Jesus doesn't filter his message. He doesn't change his message. He doesn't make it more palatable. He doesn't not use the flesh, the words flesh, or the words blood. He actually doubles down, and he he not only goes, if you don't eat of my flesh, he takes it even further, says, don't just eat my flesh, but also drink my blood. Whoever feeds on my flesh, verse 54, and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him, as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate, and died, whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. In its full context, what Jesus is saying, hey, this whole crowd follows me because of what I can do for them. They follow me because they were fed by the miracle of the bread and the fish. They follow me because of what I can do for them, not because they truly know who I am. I'm the bread of life. I'm the real bread. I'm the bread that will truly sustain you. I'm the bread that truly will satisfy you. I'm the bread that truly will give you life. If you eat of me, you will never be hungry again. If you eat of me, you will have food that will that will change you, satisfy you, sustain you, and cause you to live like no other bread. Talk about saying something that's difficult to understand. Talk about... Uh, what something that feels hard to listen to. Talk about something that makes people feel uncomfortable, right? And and the people were not only confused, but they were outraged. They they were furious. They said, "This is just too hard for us to comprehend." Jesus, you can't you can't talk like this. This this is too hard. This is too hard of a statement. It's too offensive. And Jesus wasn't going to edit himself. He wasn't going to fit, filter himself. It wasn't, he wasn't going to, to come up with a better way to say it. He wasn't coming to, to come out to put out a PR statement and apologize for a statement. No, my man doubles down in verse 61. We see him continue, and it says, verse 60, it says, When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing that, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, these are his disciples. These are people that claim to follow Jesus, said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? You're offended with me making a statement? What if you saw me resurrected and ascending? (laughs) You think you're offended now? You think you're offended now? What if you saw me resurrected and ascending? Let's talk about that in the word, the ascension of Jesus. 
Let's talk about that to the in our marketing, right? No, because it's too difficult to understand. It makes people feel like outsiders to share the truth of the gospel, the wholeness of the gospel. Why? Because we what we're what we're focused on in the church. Let's let's get down to the real truth is what we're focused on in the church is building crowds and not the church. We're more focused on building a crowd than we are building the church. But Jesus said that the only way, he continues in verse 64, he says, but there are some of you who do not believe. It is, we'll go back to 63. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who betrayed him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. What if we trusted less in our church marketing programs? What if we trusted less in our marketing strategies and more on the Father's ability to draw people in so that they might be saved. What what if we what if we trusted more in the Father bringing people to Jesus, bringing people to salvation, bringing put people to the place of grace and trusted less in our marketing strategies? Because the work of the Holy Spirit, the work of God the Father in people's lives is way more effective than the marketing strategies that we could ever come up with. Too many churches are depending more on our marketing to bring people to Jesus than God himself to bring people to himself. And it's not that we don't work diligently to to be witnesses in the world. That's not what I'm saying. We, We work hard to be witnesses to the world. But let's learn to distinguish what evangelism truly is. Because somewhere along the way, we we transitioned from sending the church out into the world to bringing the world into the church. Which has made, it's, it's made the church super effective in drawing a crowd, but very ineffective in making disciples making disciples that are equipped to faithfully and clearly share the gospel with others in every aspect of their lives, making disciples that are sharing the gospel with their families, their workplaces, their schools, at barbecues, whatever environments they find themselves. We have made it so that we are more effective at drawing a crowd than we are at making disciples. And so what we've done is make an ineffective church because drawing a crowd does not define a church's success. Because if that were the case, Jesus was losing a crowd, and he would we then by our standard, we would be considering Jesus ineffective and unsuccessful because people were walking away from him and not coming towards him. But that we know is not the truth. If anything, Jesus was most effective when he was clearly drawing the line of what makes a disciple versus what doesn't make a disciple. If you believe in him, then you are a disciple. If you don't truly believe in him, in his authority, in who he is, his power, his sacrifice, his the salvation that he provides and he can provide alone, then you can't be a disciple. And by default, you are an outsider. Why are we so afraid of making the world feel like outsiders when nobody in the world is concerned about how the world is increasingly day by day making Christians feel like outsiders, making believers feel like outsiders. And listen, that's okay. Truly, that, that's okay because the Bible lets us know that we are outsiders. We do not belong in this world. This is not our home. We are foreigners in this land. Jesus said, they will hate you because they hated me. Jesus prayed to the Father, I pray that they would know that they are in this world, 
but not of it. It's okay. We are outsiders, but let's not. Why are we making it so easy to peep for people? So palatable, so, so acceptable. We're, we're diluting it. We refuse to we'll use words that are biblical words, that are words that should be celebrated, that should be uh, uh, held to a high degree of value. It's because of the work he did on Calvary. It's because he shed his blood. It's because of his resurrection that we can experience salvation and eternal life. That's not something to be ashamed of. That's something to be celebrated. That's something to be preached from the mountaintops. That's something to be declared to the world. Why are we so ashamed of the gospel? Why are we so ashamed of it being confusing or foolish or nobody uses resurrection in everyday life in their everyday uh, conversations? Yes, and we know that to be true, but that's not foolish. Like using the word resurrection might be foolish to people, but that's the gospel, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, for the word of the cross, the word of the cross is folly, foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are believing, who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. We're not ashamed of the gospel because the gospel is the power of God to them who are being saved. Jesus didn't die to bring us hope. He didn't die to save our, change our situations. Jesus died to save us from our sins by dying on a cross at Calvary, shedding his blood for the atonement of our sins was laid in a tomb for three days, raised from the dead, resurrected on the third day, so that anyone who would put their trust and faith in him would have everlasting life, would be saved by grace through faith in him. Listen, I'm all... For I say this at our church all the time. We make it easy for people to believe in Jesus. We make it easy for people to become disciples. But we cannot make it easy for people to pretend they are disciples. And that's where it gets a little blurry. Because I believe if you ask me, and this is just my opinion, you can disagree with it if you want to. It, it, it's my opinion that when churches begin to compromise in this marketing area or evangelism, we begin to do things like, oh, well, we can't use words like resurrection. We got to use words like race life, which is the same exact thing. But the more we, we filter, the more we dilute, the less effective and important things become so that then... All kinds of crazy teachings can be brought into the church where people are being taught things that are not biblical, doctrinal, or theologically sound. And then we wonder why the church is a mess. We wonder why people are so biblically illiterate where they go to churches like this for years and years and years and they can't effectively communicate the gospel of Jesus in their everyday life because they genuinely don't know the truth of the gospel. We can do better. I think we need to focus less on what words we do not use in marketing and start teaching our churches the significance, the beauty, the power of words like the blood 
the resurrection, the atonement, the sacrifice, because these are all words that impact our eternal life and salvation. It's the very essence of the gospel. It's the reason why Jesus did everything. So anyways, that's that's my rant. That's my take on this whole thing. I ain't got nothing else to say about it. I, I, I pray that Elevation does have people who truly, genuinely repent and truly, genuinely become disciples of Jesus. But I'm concerned for the capital C church as a whole that man we are allowing the world to dictate so much of what we do in the church where where does it stop where when is it when does it when does it become enough is enough where does the line in the sand get drawn and i think it's okay to draw those lines in the sand because we are not of this kingdom the faith that we live should be a faith that disrupts our lives, the conventional way that we think, that disrupts the the status the status quos of the world, that 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 disrupts every aspect of our lives. Because every every aspect of the gospel disrupts the world, disrupts the world's ideologies, disrupts the world's beliefs. And so I just pray that we would learn the significance of these words and not allow the world to cause us to diminish them or be ashamed of them because that's ultimately what it ends up happening. Hey, if you enjoyed this podcast, if you liked this content, do me a favor, go ahead and hit the like button. Leave me a comment. Let me know what your take is on this topic and uh, share this. Subscribe. Make sure you hit that notification bell so you get notified every single time I post up a new video. I'll see you next time. I hope you enjoy your Easter. Peace.